subcultures. We see them as something out of the ordinary, something that doesn't exactly fit into the realms of popular culture. But what exactly are they? Putting them as merely different won't do them justice, as there's a lot more behind the shaven heads, cheap added as sneakers, punk outfits, and spiked black boots. The term subculture, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, defines the word as a cultural group within a larger culture, often having beliefs or interests at variance with those of the larger culture. In addition, sociologist David Reisman distinguishes the majority, which passively accepted commercially provided styles and meanings, from the minority style of subculture, and interpreted it in accordance with subversive values. If we look around in the present day, we can see evidence of this everywhere, from cosplaying for Japanese animations, cult followings for famous films, steampunk for the fiction genres, and so on. These subcultures all have their collective characteristics that marks their identity and gets recognized. But what about music? Whilst media and entertainment culture has evolved over the past couple of decades and spawned numerous subcultures underneath, there is a distinctively less amount of attention being paid on how musical subcultures have adapted over the same amount of time. There were a couple of reasons for why this is the case, which I'll introduce one to you right now. Accessibility. If we rewind back to the mid-1940s, subcultures wasn't a movement yet. Rather, it was a term used to describe the youths of the working class. Teenagers and young adults who rebelled against their working class superiors slash parents advocating on their personal values of delinquency, criminal behavior, social deviance, and urbanization. What better way to spread these beliefs and values than music? There was none. Music would dictate what groups of youths would wear, how they would dance, who hung out with whom, and what drugs to take. Kids would spend what little they had to try and carve out an identity outside of an oppressively conservative mainstream culture at the time. Let's take the mods for example. By name, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. The mods were youths that thrived on the fashion sense of American soul bands and British R&B groups during the post-war economic boom. Songwriters such as Slade were the defining image of these youths, who would throw every penny they got for suits and sharp outfits, then engage and socialize in the blue beat and rock-steady filled dance halls of the 1950s. Fashion photographer Elaine Constantine would remember the experience as she described Music was all-encompassing, emotional, and raw. It was life as we knew it, and it was brilliant. Music was hard to come by in this time, and teenagers would seek out rare tracks from obscure labels. Kids in brogues, baggy trousers, and Freddy Perry's would journey as far as the rough ghettos of Black America to find the holy grail of buried b-sides, forgotten tracks, and songs that had never seen the light of a proper label release. The outsider thing was a great feeling. We were all awake and dancing when everyone else was in a drunken slumber after a night at the local, dancing to the charts. Elaine's recount of exploration, experience, and discovery is what drove the musical subcultures of the 20th century. The thrills of living in the moment, complete rebellion and opposition to mainstream culture, and a sense of freedom the youth's parents or guardians couldn't afford to give them. That same thrill is almost non-existent when we look back to the present day. This is where accessibility that I mentioned takes cue. With 51% of the world's population having access to the internet as of June in 2017, we and the new generation, dubbed Millennials or Generation XYZ, have our favorite tunes at the touch of a button. Our form of pleasure came in the media on our computers or TVs, and the games on our mobile tablets and smartphones. Clothes and garments are in mass production and selling for as low as a dollar, and class segregation is extinct as advocation for equality became realized through the decades. The favorite musical trends are there with a Google search, the fan gear and the appropriate services a credit card swipe away, and your favorite playlist of all the music you like can be on your friend's portable speaker just by saying, OK Google, play my Michael playlist. However, accessibility is not only part of the equation towards the end of musical subcultures as we know it. All this freedom also partially contributes to my second reason. Exposure. I'll let my good like Derek Ridges explain this one. There is a less of a separation between youth groups now than there was in the late 70s and early 80s. 
Because of Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, everything can be in the spotlight on the same day it happens. If anything interesting happens, people will tweet it as a status, and immediately other people will know about it. And then almost as immediately more people will be online knocking it and criticizing it. So these things don't have a real chance to grow out of the spotlight like they used to. He's right, folks. The one thing that sustains subculture's very existence is their opposition to mainstream culture. Rebellion and subversiveness is in its participants' nature, and they rose in strong defiance to the parents' conservative views and the oppression of the government's regime. These conditions of living are gone now, however. We now live in an era where information is almost forced onto us due to its sheer ease of use. The younger generations who are spoiled by such excess rights aren't as inclined to follow subcultures because of this, and most of the music they listen to also doesn't dictate the many styles of clothing they should wear. One of the UK's biggest pioneers of the acid house music genre, Mike Pickering, also agreed on this. It's much harder to keep things underground these days due to the internet creating an I want everything and I want to know generation. I think there are still many subcultures, they are just nothing quite as revolutionary. Yes, subcultures are still around, but when we look at the health goth movement or the sea punk groups, they are in a completely different league of their own, not to mention the fact that they are image based, not music based. With the sheer wealth of choices available to us, the ease of which we can access to it, and how programmed we are to consume rapidly, we are no longer obliged to commit to specific genres, like before. Taste in music is no longer a thing where you conform to people's choices to look cool or to follow a movement you believed in. It's much more down to individual beliefs, values, and the need for instant gratification. As such, exposure of new cultural movements today can be seen in and dismissed in a blink of an eye, which is one of the many reasons why musical subcultures disappeared from the radar over the years. It wasn't the lack of hype or the lack of interest. It was the freedom of choice.